Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> We're going to try our class again today on the Dutch test. So uh, that little three-letter internet service provider kept ki uh, kept kicking me off yesterday, so I kind of gave up. Uh, seems to be working this morning, <clears throat> uh, and it's been working through this pandemic thing. So uh, I had trouble with uh, the provider oh about a year ago, so much that I was going to get a different internet service provider, but <clears throat> that didn't happen. So we are reviewing the Dutch test. Uh, Tammy Crabtree, our nutritionist and physical fitness guru, asked me to look into doing a class on the Dutch test, so I had to do a little bit of research. Um, it is not <clears throat> as expensive as what someone thought yesterday, about a $400 test. I found a lab that will do these for $199. They're easy to do. The collection is simple. It's a um, dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. It also involves um, metabolites of cortisol. We're, we're not going to talk about those in class today. Specifically, we're going to talk about um, female hormone balance and the metabolites that you find on the Dutch test. The other thing, if even $199 is... Um, Expense too expensive for you. Um, you can get a serum basic female hormone panel right now from Life Extension for $56.25. Uh, message me, I'll send you the link, or email me at brianjtracymd at gmail.com, B R Y A N J T R E A C Y M D at gmail.com. Um, <clears throat> so I sent that link to somebody yesterday that thought the Dutch test was uh, a little bit stiff priced for her. But you have options. And right now, Life Extension, all their labs are on sale um, until I think July 9th. Um, even a complete blood count metabolic panel and a lipid panel, uh, again, <clears throat> best deal there is right now is $26. Uh, for <clears throat> basically the labs that your doctor is going to run anyway through your insurance. So depending on what your copay is, $26 is a pretty good deal. And then for hormone panels at $56, this is about a two, well, probably a $400 test for $56. And you order it yourself, direct access. So I just have to send you the link. Okay, so Dutch complete. So if you do the complete, and you don't have to do a complete Dutch test. So again, it's dried urine testing for comprehensive hormones. And what you get <clears throat> is a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so you get testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, melatonin. Okay, there's a measure of oxidative stress. Uh, there's a measure of androgen or male hormone metabolites. Nutritional organic acids, so your vitamin B levels. Estrogen metabolism. Um, neurotransmitter metabolism. Cortisol metabolites, a free cortisol pattern. Free, not like the test is free. It's free cortisol circulating. <clears throat> and then there's a testing for cortisol awakening response. So why would you use a Dutch test? Well, one, you can order it yourself and you don't have to get stuck. So there's no blood involved. It's urine. So you just collect four or five dried urine samples over 24 hours. Uh, they're stable for several weeks. They like to have them back within a week or two. Um, <clears throat> so you send the dried samples back to the lab and they send you the report that I attached to the little quick video that I did this morning at 8 o'clock. Okay, so there's a validation process, there's quality control, accuracy, recovery, linearity. Um, uh, depending on what lab you use, um, and the, you know, the lab <clears throat> from this um, report is, um, let me see, I'm going to go way back to, so it's Precision Analytical Incorporated is the lab that, uh, the lab report we're going to review. And so it's a fair amount of um, information that you get just from urinary metabolites. It's kind of interesting um, to see um, what's involved. Uh, and I put up that um, report so you can see what kind of detail you get. So it was designed, this test was designed to be optimally effective for most forms of hormone replacement therapy. The woman's 
sample report going to go through <clears throat> we're going to go through is 26 years old and she's uh, she's set up to look at menstrual regu irregularity you can use this testing for um, infertility and ovulation problems with ovulation abnormal bleeding premenstrual syndrome premenstrual dysphoric disorder disorder um, and it also <clears throat> um, helps with um, evaluating appropriate dosing for oral and vaginal hormone replacement therapy in perimenopausal women as well as women that are on menopausal hormone replacement therapy. Bioidenticals is what I've done for about 30 years, um, actually more than that. <clears throat> so um, we're not talking about Permarin and Provera, those horrifying hormone replacements that are still being used all over the world, I'm guessing, but certainly all over the country. So Dutch testing is urinary based. There is no 24 hour urine collection, which is fraught with um, uh, cumbersome collection and about 40% uh, have an error in their collection rate. So this is four or five dried samples throughout the day. Um, salivary testing uh, has been pretty good over the years. There's some pretty, inf uh, pretty good information you get from salivary testing, but it's kind of gross because you have to spit in this tube for 24 hours. Uh, and you miss some of the cortisol metabolite uh, stuff, so there's more testing involved if you're looking at cortisol and adrenal function. And then what about serum testing? Well, there's FDA analyzers, FDA approved uh, analyzers for serum testing, but it does lack in some areas because you're getting a point. You get th that particular time. I had my blood drawn at 10.05 a.m. And that's what your hormones look like at 10.05 a.m. The Dutch test is looking uh, at the metabolites and the levels over a 24-hour period, so you get a fuller picture and more precise clinical diagnosis of hormone imbalances as well as uh, for monitoring hormone replacement therapy. So let's get into this report. <clears throat> uh, so this is a 26-year-old that's reporting, a 26-year-old female that's reporting regular menstrual cycles, okay? Um, so this is just a sample report. It's a fake patient. Um, you would get a different clinical history, which is what we do with health coaching and my medical directors when we oversee what's going on with uh, perimenopause, menopause, or abnormal uterine bleeding, premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, all those things that are cycle related. Okay, so the top of the report is progesterone metabolism. So progesterone is a hormone made in the ovaries after ovulation. If ovulation doesn't occur, then there's low progesterone levels in what's called the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. And the luteal phase uh, is a 12 to 14 day phase after ovulation. <clears throat> so that seems, for most women, that is pretty much the correct amount of days of that phase, 12 to 14 days. The follicular phase prior to um, ovulation uh, can be fairly variable. So you have women that have 28-day cycles, 21-day cycles, 35-day cycles, and the variability is prior to ovulation. Okay, So <clears throat> you get little pie charts. Uh, I didn't put that on this report. This report is just numbers, uh, but the actual report is 18 pages long. If you get the Dutch complete test, okay, so <clears throat> if you do the test in the luteal phase, if you're prior to menopause, it can pretty much help determine if you ovulated five to seven days previously. So the ideal on a 28-day ideal physiology textbook cycle, you would do this test about day 21 to 24. So the primary role of progesterone is to pre prepare the lining of the uterus for implantation if pregnancy occurs. It also balances the effect of estrogen. So we talk about estrogen and progesterone balance quite a bit in perimenopause and then in menopause. So estrogen dominance is more common in women that are past about the age of 38. And a lot of the gynecologic issues that I've dealt with over the 30 years I was in practice had to do with estrogen imbalance, so estrogen dominance. So progesterone is also a neurosteroid. Uh, it acts as a diuretic, so you urinate more uh, often. 
and it raises basal, basal body temperature and it's slightly sedating. So it makes you warmer, you feel warmer. Um, and so a lot of women take that, their progesterone at bedtime to help them go to sleep, stay asleep and stay warm. <clears throat> so this test is measuring metabolites of progesterone, specifically 5-beta pregnane diol and 5-alpha pregnane diol. So 5-beta pregnane diol has less activity in the body, uh, but it represents a larger percent of total progesterone metabolism. 5-alpha <clears throat> pregnane diol is more interesting. It can cross the blood-brain barrier and it upright regulates GABA activity in the brain, gamma aminobutyric acid, which is sedating. It calms your brain, uh, which is why progesterone stimulating GABA crossing the, by crossing the blood-brain barrier helps uh, women fall to sleep, fall asleep. <clears throat> it's also neuroprotective. It's a neurotransmitter, and GABA is protective to the brain. Okay, <clears throat> however, in some women, 5-alpha pregnane diol is a cause for premenstrual dysphoric disorder and irritability due to difficulties with the GABA receptor and sensitivity with fluctuating, neuro, uh, fluctuating levels of neurosteroids. So if progesterone levels are low or on the lower end of the luteal reference range compared to estrogen levels, women experience symptoms such as premenstrual syndrome, menorrhagia, which is heavy bleeding, nostalgia, breast tenderness, moodiness, anxiety, and or insomnia. So, so the metabolites of progesterone are excreted in the urine, not progesterone itself, but you can correlate urinary metabolites and calculate the serum progesterone, progesterone level. So you get a serum <clears throat> equivalent of progesterone on uh, the summary page of this report. Okay, so in this particular woman, progesterone is low in her luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, so you have to double check and make sure she did the test in the luteal phase of her cycle, so cycle day 21 to 24, okay, before you can really interpret that. Uh, and if it's done past the progesterone peak about cycle day 21 through 24, <clears throat> um, uh, this particular test likely shows that this woman, woman did not ovulate that particular cycle because her progesterone metabolites are low. So no fertile egg, no progesterone production from the corpus luteum. And so the recommendation, uh, and the recommendations made by the lab is supporting the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. That's the brain to ovary communication window uh, with vitamin B6, which is kind of a mainstay for cycle regularity and ovulation and eradicating PMS symptoms, in addition to luteal phase progesterone support, such as uh, bioidentical progesterone or prometrium, micronized progesterone by mouth. So we'll move on to estrogen metabolism based on this lab report. So <clears throat> it's important to assess estrogen levels and metabolites of estrogen so is the status low, normal, or high for estrogen production? And levels of the primary ovarian estrogen, which is estradiol or 17-beta estradiol, the most, uh, it's the strongest uh, estrogen produced, <clears throat> as well as total estrogen. So you get a measure of three, okay? <clears throat> if women are not on hormone replacement therapy, you have to kind of consider the appropriate range based on the age, so perimenopause or postmenopausal. And you will see in postmenopausal women, they make no estradiol, and they make most of their <clears throat> estrogen as estrone, which is in the made in the peripheral body fat. So women that are heavier tend not to have es total estrogen deficiency because they're making estrone. Estradiol is the specific estrogen that's produced by a reproductive age woman, woman um, from her ovary. Okay, there's three different pathways. There's a 2-hydroxy pathway. That's the safest one and has anti-cancer properties of the 2-hydroxy metabolites of, a, of estrogen. So all you hear about is estrogen causes cancer. Well, that's not true. It depends on what the metabolic pathway is. 
And then the 4-hydroxy pathway is the most toxic because those metabolites can create reactive products, so oxidative stress, <clears throat> that can damage DNA and then lead to uh, a cancerogenic effect. And then the third pathway, 16-hydroxy, creates the most estrogenic of the metabolites, although it's less estrogenic than actual estradiol. So it's 16 hydroxyestriol. And if you remember a previous class, there's three types of estrogens. Estradiol from the ovary, estrone from peripheral fat metabolism, um, and then estriol. And the only time women make estriol is in their placenta while they're pregnant. It's a protective estrogen for the breast and the uterus, and it's the feel-good estrogen. <clears throat> so it's highest at about 20 weeks and I always talk about the glow of pregnancy. Well, the glow of pregnancy is based on estriol. Okay, so <clears throat> um, if overall estrogen levels are high, production of 16-hydroxyestriol may exacerbate high estrogen symptoms, although estriol tends to be not symptomatic. And then women with low levels of uh, estrogens may have less low estrogen symptoms if the 16 hydroxy metabolism is preferred. Okay, so <clears throat> you have to look at not just the estrogen levels, you have to look at the metabolite, uh, metabolites of estrogen and what pathway they're metabolically going through. Okay, so specifically for this young lady, Patients typically metabolize a much higher percentage of their estrogens down the more protective 2-hydroxy pathway in what's called phase 1 detoxification. There are women, <clears throat> and I did a consult for a health coach uh, who is using diendolomethane, uh, or DIM, um, which helps move estrogens more efficiently down the 2-hydroxy pathway. So that's a way of doing hormone replacement using DIM, using the estrogens made in the body and putting them down that more favorable pathway. That does tend to lower the other estrogens, including estrone and estradiol as well. <clears throat> so you have to consider uh, maybe a higher dose of estrogen on women that are on hormone replacement therapy and are actually into menopausal syndrome. And then methylation is involved. That's part of phase two metabolism of estrogen. So after phase one, both 4-hydroxy and 2-hydroxy, not the 16-hydroxy estrogens, can be deactivated and eliminated by methylation. And this brings up the MTHFR genetic defect. So some women and men do not methylate appropriately. So what about androgens? So, so specifically DHEA and testosterone. <clears throat> so DHEA and androstenedione are made almost exclusively by the adrenal gland. A small amount is made in the ovaries. And these metabolites and hormones appear in the urine as DHEA sulfate, so dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate, as well as androsterone and etiocolonone. So DHEA peaks for men and women in their 20s and 30s. There's a slow decline expected with age, and it drops quite a bit at age 40. So DHEA mainly circulates as the sulfate, DHEA sulfate, with interconversion to active DHEA as it reaches the tissue levels. DHEA is a weak androgen and will uh, pretty much convert to androstenedione, which then converts to testosterone or estrogen. So it is a way to do uh, like a mini hormone replacement therapy um, using over-the-counter DHEA because some of that does com convert to estrogens and testosterone. It does not have a diurnal rhythm like most hormones, so it's considered the best way to assess DHEA levels in the body uh, with the sulfate measurement. Okay. So the best way to assess DHEA production is to add up the three metabolites of DHEA. Uh, and DHEA, DHEA does fall significantly with age. So part of the anti-aging medicine movement is to keep DHEA levels um, <clears throat> at the level that you had when you were about 30 as you get older. 
So adrenal DHEA serves as the main source of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone for postmenopausal women. That was on my physiology final exam. Uh, the <clears throat> pathway of steroids that were made from cholesterol through preg uh, pregnenolone and then DHEA. So they had to show me <laughs> on their test how all of that was metabolized and converted. So in this report, the total DHEA production was 2,516 nanograms per milligram in the normal range and also appropriate for a 26-year-old. So the adrenal glands in this 26-year-old young woman are producing appropriate DHEA levels. However, the DHEA sulfate is lower than the other major metabolites <clears throat> since DHEA is mostly formed in the adrenal gland by a sulfation. Inflammatory conditions or chronic inflammation, reactive species, oxygen species, this chronic inflammation can block sulfation of DHEA and lower DHEAS levels. So the circulating levels go down <clears throat> and then conversion to DHEA in the tissues is lowered. So <clears throat> since this young woman's DHEA sulfate metab metabolite is lower, she probably has um, an element of chronic inflammation. And so that can be supported uh, with uh, MSM, sulfur-containing foods, molybdenum, and then supporting adrenal health through adaptogens and stress um, management. So kind of fascinating information uh, just from this lab on, okay, what's going on and what can we do about it. Okay, so the Dutch test also measures the total of testosterone, glucuronide, and testosterone sulfate which are conjugates of testosterone formed mostly from bioavailable testosterone. So remember, total testosterone doesn't mean it's bioavailable. Most of it is held by sex hormone binding globulin. So if you just have a total testosterone test, that really doesn't tell you a whole lot. You need to know what the free testosterone and bioavailable testosterone levels are. And then you can, with this test, measure the metabolites. <clears throat> so bioavailable testosterone undergoes phase two metabolism to make it ready for urine ex excretion. So females make most of their DHEA in the adrenal gland, and a fraction of that DHEA tri uh, trickles down metabolically to testosterone, which is also made by the ovaries. So menopause, uh, menopausal women, when they go through menopause, lose about half their ability to make testosterone. <clears throat> Okay, so you can understand testosterone levels better by considering downstream metabolites such as 5-alpha-androstenediol, 5-beta-androstenediol, and technically these metabolites can also be formed from DHEA uh, through the testosterone pathway, but they generally all tend to correlate with testosterone production. Testosterone declines with age. We will do a class coming up coming up on testosterone deficiency and replacement uh, in women as they age, okay? The lab test here provides age-dependent ranges, but remember, the idea is to get you back in hormone balance like you were when you were about 30 years old. So perimenopausal women, sometimes their testosterone goes up a little bit before declining again. And so testosterone in women helps support skin and connective tissue, bone, as well as muscle integrity, and helps promote dopamine conversion in the brain, which helps with mood and sexual uh, libido, okay? So the testosterone level for this 26-year-old woman is 1.5, which is low. And so if she doesn't have symptoms of low testosterone, so I usually give them an atom questionnaire from St. Louis University, which is designed for men. Um, <clears throat> and instead of asking about erectile dysfunction, you ask about clitoral sensitivity. There's no technically scientific basis or studies on that questionnaire in women. Uh, <clears throat> but symptoms of low testosterone affect women just as often as they do men. They just Women just don't need as much testosterone. So if she, would, if she were to have low testosterone symptoms, 
um, you can offer her a treatment program uh, based on her low urinary testosterone. Okay, so androgens like DHEA and testosterone in women help with muscle and weight mem um, maintenance, memory, brain function, mood, libido, and a sense of well-being. So there are lifestyle and diet modif dietary modifications that can be considered to help increase androgens, specifically weightlifting, and then high-intensity interval training. That is absolutely true for men. Uh, men that have low testosterone do better if they do weightlifting. And then <clears throat> women can take DHEA or testosterone replacement therapy if it's appropriate and indicated. Same with men. You don't treat numbers, you treat symptoms, okay? So that's a basic primer, 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 primary, primer on <clears throat> the Dutch test for women, dried urine testing for uh, compre comprehensive hormones. There's more to this test. We can talk about cortisol and adrenal steroids that are measured in this test as well. Uh, and then we'll do, a t we'll do a class on testosterone deficiency and testosterone replacement therapy in women who are uh, symptomatic and past the age of 40. Hi, Shelly. Um, so that's coming up. Uh, we'll get back into the weight loss, how do you lose weight part of class as well. So again, if you want a Dutch test, send me a Facebook Messenger or email me at brianjcracymd at gmail.com or if you want a serum test for $56 through Life Extension, email me and I'll send you the link. So have a great day. Um, it's still cool here in Missouri. I keep thinking I'm going to plant some more stuff, but I'm um, not sure yet. It's getting down into the upper 30s, lower 40s at night. So I will talk to you tomorrow um, and I'll have something else cool to teach you. All right. Have a great day. See ya. Bye.